You're listening to Coming of Cage, a Nicolas Cage podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Coming of Cage podcast. I am your host, Derek. I've got my buddy Ryan here with me. Hi. Hi. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I don't know that we've ever recorded a podcast on a Friday before, but hey, what are you going to do? You know, this is the benefit of not doing it live. That's true. That's true. That is convenient. So what are we talking about this week? So if you did not see our Wheel O' Cage spin on social media, go to comingofcage.com for that. We talked about the 2017 flick, Inconceivable of course, starring Nick Cage, as well as Gina Gershon and Nikki Whelan, Whelan, Whelan. Um, those are kind of the main characters. I guess Faye Dunaway is also in it a bit. And it's directed by Jonathan Baker, who has primarily just played himself on various reality TV shows over the years. But he also was in this movie as a character as well. That's true. He is Barry. Yeah. Yeah, you are right. So, yeah, that's the movie Inconceivable 2017 flick. We watched it on Amazon through uh, Freebie, which was weird. That was a strange experience. Yeah, I don't know that watching it without ads would have made it any better. But, uh, yeah, I don't look forward to having to use that in the future. Unless Freebie becomes a sponsor of this podcast, in which case I can't wait for the next time I get to watch a movie on Freebie. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to take the leap and say it would have been slightly better simply because the, the ads were not timed. They just kind of happened when they happened Yeah. in the middle of movements, in the middle of scenes. So it was just awkward cuts that were kind of jarring. A little bit, yeah. And I didn't even know what Freebie was. So for those who don't know, if you have Amazon Prime Video, some stuff is available for free, but it's ad-supported through this other third-party service called Freebie that has its own movies and TV shows and original content, apparently. I learned all about it. And you get an ad every, like, 20 minutes. Yeah. Or 15 minutes or something, so. I didn't time it. I'm going to go with 15 minutes because there were a lot of ad That's breaks. True. And this, this, is, this movie is an hour and 45 minutes, and it took me well over two hours to watch it. Yeah, I agree. It so. was not fun. No, but we're not I, reviewing freebie here. We're not. No, you're right. You're right. So we'll, this is a drama thriller, according to IMDb. And I thought I would just read the synopsis because I think it really doesn't give you the whole picture. So this is what we knew going in. A mother looks to escape her abusive past by moving to a new town where she befriends another mother who grows suspicious of her. That did not prepare me for this movie, Ryan. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a little underselling it a little bit (laughs) and like not in a good way. This movie, man, I mean, pardon my language. This movie was fucked up. This was a fucked up movie. I mean, I don't know if fucked up. I mean, yes, there was some (laughs) fucked up stuff that happened in it, but also it was just a bad movie. (laughs) I think that would be my first descriptor. It would just be bad. I mean, I don't disagree with that. I don't disagree with it being bad. This was a, this was strange. This movie was both um, really stressful, but also like went on forever at the same time. Yeah, Which, they 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 made it. They extended it out to try and like deepen these characters, but none of them ever felt like deeper than a kiddie pool. Yeah. So let's just dive right in the, the general premise here. So Gina's character. Angela and Nick's character, Brian, are married and they're extremely wealthy doctors who live in a huge mansion with a guest house that looks to be at least the size of my regular house and, you know, big in ground pool, the whole nine. They're very, very rich. Um, And Angela's on um, leave. I mean, I like they didn't really say maternity leave because she went through some drug issues and stuff like that, but she's on leave. She's not working right now. And this Katie character played by Nikki Whelan, she shows up and they befriend her so fast. Yes. I, I wanted to just, if, if you watch some of our other episodes of this show or listen to some of our episodes of the show, you know that on some of these movies, I've gone to the liberty of taking a lot of notes yes. about my thoughts 
throughout the movie. So I definitely have thoughts on basically everything that happens in this movie because, uh, yeah, this is, we've only done like four episodes or something, but this is, this is my longest list so far. This is number four. This is number four. So where, what's your first note? Let's start there. What's my first first note is no helmet question mark. (laughs) Because right out of the gate, Nick Cage, they make, they make a point to show him on this motorcycle that I'm, I think maybe is, is something that they thought people would think is cool. I don't know. It just looked like a old person motorcycle to me. It was a Harley. uh, Yeah, but that's an old person motorcycle. Harley Harley Davidson's going out of business or not going out of business. They're not doing well right now. They haven't for a while. Um, But yeah, probably in 2017, this movie might be what took them down, honestly. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, that's my first note because shame on you, Nick. Wear a helmet. I'm sure it's not up to you. It was probably the director's thing, but, you know, stand up for something. We didn't actually see helmets save lives. If that helps. Yeah, but there wasn't like a helmet on the back of it or anything like that. You know, it's it's implied that he's such a bad boy that he doesn't need to wear a helmet. And that's another thing I want to say right out of the gate. Based because what was the romantic comedy called that we watched? Uh, It could happen to you. It could happen to you. So in that movie, one of the comments that I made and you you made also was that basically everybody in the movie is an asshole. And in this movie, basically everyone in the movie is an asshole as well. Although Nick Cage's character in that movie was probably less of an asshole. He sometimes at least tried to do the right thing. And in this movie, he is just a complete asshole all through the movie until the last like five minutes. He seemed to me, he came off more absentee. Like he just didn't give a shit what was going on. I'll change your mind by the end of this. I mean, probably, but like, that was just my initial take was just that like, he's there kind of, and that's about as far as it goes. No, I'm absolutely going to change your mind by the end of this podcast. (laughs) My second note, Nick's hair is bad. Distractingly bad. It was a weird look for him because this is 2017. So this is five years ago. We just saw him in the unbearable weight of massive talent. He looked older and worse in this movie like they purposely made him seem less attractive or my theory is that they didn't actually have any hair and makeup on this movie (laughs) and that they were that's just how nick showed up and they were like okay let's run with it yeah i mean maybe that's not true but his the the dye job was bad like the way his hair was cut and like there was always hair all over the place in every scene. Like, you know, usually on set, somebody I imagine is going to be like, hold on, hold on. You got a hair that's like out of place. We need you to look good, you know, but in this one, it was just like, let it fly, Nick. And yeah, not great. It was, it was almost distracting through most of the movie. Hmm. And that's fair. Me. I noticed it. I wouldn't say it was distracting to me, but it definitely seemed like he looked worse than he should look in that. Yes, movie. I agree. You know? Yeah, he's a better looking man than what this movie gave him credit for. He's a better looking guy when he just shows up to like, you know, in paparazzi some... photos and stuff. Yeah, he looks exactly. Better, yeah. yeah. So it's almost like that's why I think like it feels like they went out of their way to make him seem less attractive. Yeah. You know, so that was odd. Um, so to get to, to get through to the next note, we have to explain that they the women meet through because you said mentioned that they became best friends immediately. or whatever immediately. Yeah. Um, which I think I have a note in there about that also, but, um, they meet through a mommy and me business. And as someone who does not have kids and will not have kids and has no interest in having kids, you do have kid and a very cute kid. And what is a mommy and me business? Cause I had no idea. So maybe you don't either. I don't know. So just real quick, movie-wise, this introduces the character Linda, played by Natalie Eva Marie. She's done a bunch of TV, but this was her first film. Um, And she is the one who owns this business. So things are a little different for my wife and I because we had our kid during COVID, our first kid during COVID, and uh, we're being very careful about all of that. So we're not doing a lot of social things. But a mommy and me group is really an opportunity for parents of kids to meet other parents of kids in a similar age bracket. So their kids have playmates, the adults can kind of help take turns and do activities together and chaperone and things like that. And people monetize this. It can be done. If you were going to do like a matchmaking thing. Now it's important to note that this, that the, the Brian and Angela couple here is insanely wealthy. They are very, very rich. My wife and I would never pay for a service like that for twofold. First, we have a lot of friends who have kids in the same age bracket as my kid. So we're going to want to hang out with our friends as much as we can. 
And we don't have that kind of exposable income. You know, disposable like, income. Yeah. Yes. Like we had to have a conversation about joining the zoo because of the cost of that. Right. So like, this isn't a business for people like me. And I would imagine if you had kids, probably people like you too. I just don't think we would spend the money on that. But if you're, if you got enough money, people have services for everything. So how do you think uh, the, uh, the blonde lady, the blonde, the, the Katie, Katie, yeah. how do you think that she could afford this? Because she is not wealthy. She's on the run and has a business doing something carpentry or something. She says something random in the beginning of the movie. Yeah. So she's doing like construction, like basic construction, construction and yeah. like painting and stuff like that. Um, here was my take on that. It's not explained in the movie, which is always a problem for me. You ha- like I-, I shouldn't have to come up with ways to make the movie work. But my first thought was this woman has killed at least three people and tried to kill another. I assume she has no problem stealing shit. She, she did steal the necklace right off of a dead woman that she just killed. So I assume she's just stolen money over the years. Okay. And, and by the way, I mean, it seems like her crimes were mostly in a, like they were, they were for a specific reason and they weren't to like get her ahead. Well, that's true. They were to give retribution to people that she deemed had wronged her in some way. Absolutely. I just don't think it's inconsistent for her to also have grabbed some cash from those people she deemed didn't deserve to live. You know, and, but it is also important to note that Katie and Linda are in a romantic relationship together. But at this point, we don't know that. We don't know that yet, but that could be an explanation that maybe Katie's not paying for the service. Right. She's just getting it, you know, free. free. And Linda, it felt like Linda was also starting out this business. She was kind of new. It was like a side business on top of her. It sounded like she had like a fitness type thing. Yeah, which they never really explore either. But so I'm assuming that she just did this for Katie as a favor. Fair enough. Yeah, that's that's a, that that is a fair explanation. I mean, I don't really love it, but I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> then after they meet for the very first time, she they get invited over to dinner. Yes. Right? At the very rich house. And so the first thing that struck me about this is that there's a table in the middle of the backyard for no reason. And that's where they have this dinner. Yeah. So they, they, they put the table there for the dinner. That's but like, it's, no, they eat there like multiple times, though. I don't they, throughout the movie. It's not just this one time. Mm, I feel like that okay. table lives there. OK. And for some reason, they just have a random ass table in the middle of their backyard where they sometimes have dinner parties at. It just seems very weird. The people that I hang out with would not necessarily have a table in the middle of their backyard for any reason. I'm going to assume that that is explained by it just looked nice when they were filming it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but it's, we have to take it in the context of what's presented to us. And yeah, yeah. it just seems like an over, like to, to flaunt their wealth even more. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that was kind of the key though, was to really stretch out that wealth. I mean, right. That's why Which, like in the end didn't really matter that much. So like, it wasn't that important to the story. Um, Except for the, like, being able to pay her to be a surrogate or whatever, which we'll get to. But that's the only time where it ever really comes into play. I mean, the the guest house is a big piece. Like, they have this massive guest house in the backyard that they just let Katie and her kid live in. Right. You know, I think that's important. Sure. But there's a lot of movies where they have people living in guest houses and they're not obscenely wealthy. You know, uh, multiplicity comes to mind. Um, there's well, a few others that I've seen yeah. where they're just like a normal person that has a decent sized guest house. Cause back then it was not that, you know, and when that came movie came out it was the nineties, but you know, you know what I mean? You don't have to be obscenely wealthy to have a guest house. That's true. Th- these people are, but that's yes, true. they are, but I don't think it's that important. Really. They just really want to stress it for that reason. Anyway, that's fair. Not worth, you know, getting too deep into, I suppose. My next note was at the end of this dinner, which this, this is explained later. But in the moment, it seemed very weird. So Linda was the, the bodybuilder woman, yes. right? Yes. And then Katie, uh, th- Linda, like, goes over to Katie and just, like, whispers in her ear, walk me out. And then they just walk out together and there's nothing. Like, it just cuts. Yeah. And it, it seemed like the setup for something and there was nothing there. Obviously, you find out later that they're a couple. And so that kind of goes back to that. But I still expected that there seemed to be something cut from there that because the, the, even in the con, once you learn that they're a couple, that doesn't still seem like something they needed to show at that point. 
that whole conversation that whole scene is super awkward though like because they're trying to show that donna brian's mother uh who's played by faye dunaway that she's like this mean cranky person and so they really overdo it like she is just like very prodding and very rude and it's just a very awkward meal and you know the the other guy barry's just sitting there he has nothing to add to the conversation or to the scene in any respect i guess is he supposed to be brian's brother okay that's in my notes too i guess somewhere because Jonathan Baker just wanted an excuse to be on screen, I think. And that's fine. Directors can do that. Oh, yeah. But- OK, I have it right here. Who is the random guy at holiday dinners and in family pictures? Because he doesn't do anything until the very end of the movie. And even then, you, he doesn't really do that much. But you're expected to believe that he's like a super close member of the family, even though he never gets any kind of introduction like every other member of the family. He's just there. At that dinner, it was like a Fourth of July dinner or Memorial Day Memorial or something. Day. Yeah. And yeah, he's there for that. But yeah, he never gets any screen time until the very end. No, cool. Because most of these characters don't like they don't really talk a whole lot to each other in any substantive way. So, like, I think Barry's Brian's brother. Because he's always sitting with Donna. He's always sitting with the mom. And Could so I, I feel like it just has to be another kid of hers. Could be, but we don't really get any kind of explanation. So, you know, yeah, it's not really that important to the important to the plot it was mostly just like why is he here because Mm -hmm. they could have done the whole thing without him yeah it was just the director wanting to be in the movie also and add to his credits i'm assuming um at one point when they're talking i think the morning after because they spend the night that night like uh, yeah they they fall asleep in the living room they do like a little slumber party and the mom is there in the morning i think and i think she tells angela gina gershon's character that uh uh, that Katie gives her the willies, which made me laugh because a few years later, Nick Cage did a movie called Willie's Wonderland. And <laughs> I know that's a common expression. It just is funny in the context of Nick Cage because, you know. Yes. So it's it's Donna who says that. So oh, Nick, okay. Brian Brian's mom, Nick Cage's character's mom says that. And so, yeah, so in this scene that the kids have a little summer party, there's only two kids. Linda doesn't have a kid in this. So there's just the two kids, the three women, they fall asleep in the living room. And Brian comes home from work at some like crazy hour. And then basically they're woken up to their kids screaming bloody murder, but they're just having fun in the kitchen. Right. It's a definitely like a, a, a scream of something is really happening, mm-hmm. but then they play it off like, Oh no, they were just playing. But that scream was not just playing. No, you know what I mean? It's like the, it's like the equivalent of a jump scare, right? Yes. Like it's just like the scream and then it's nothing. Yeah. You know, exactly. which I don't like that as a I mechanic, hate it too. personally. So one thing we didn't really cover, we did say that these two people are very rich, yes. um, but that is because they are both doctors. Yes. Um, but that the wife, Gina Gershon's character, uh, she doesn't work anymore because of some complications that she had with pregnancy and things like that. She also has a pill addiction that right. they reference a lot of times and becomes a plot point later. Um, my, my big gripe with like the entire plot is that she's wanting to go back to work. There is no place that would hire a doctor that had a, a well-known, well-documented pill addiction to work again around pills. And that, she, that would make sense to me. I can't say that I know that, but that makes sense to me. Uh, I don't know that for a fact either, but I can't imagine anywhere in the world that they'd be like, oh, yeah, let's let this person that has a history of abusing pills and has just not been to work and not been using his pills for like six months or something. I don't know. Time is really weird in this movie, too. Time is very strange. um, But well, she's gone. She's gone through rehab and and all these other things. So I assume that that so she's not on leave. She's not actually on maternity leave. That's why I was saying at the beginning, that's a little nebulous. She's on leave. And I think it's due to the drug situation. It felt like the point was she had to go to rehab and do some certain things in a program to get back to work is what that seemed like. Now, maybe there is some type of process that people are willing to you know, accept people back f- from if they go through certain rehab steps. I don't really know if you have house, if you base anything off of the TV show house, I mean, he was, he was addicted to pills the entire show. That was the whole premise. And, you know, sure. Uh, yeah, but I think that show is well known for not being a realistic take on medicine in any way. But I will say that if you have any addicts in your life, and most people do have an addict in their life of some kind, that one of the big things about addiction is that once you're an addict, you're always an addict, and that it's an everyday struggle 
to not give in to that addiction. And that's kind of more serious than this thing that we're trying to do. But in the context of the movie, yeah. um, putting somebody that has a known pill addiction uh, into a hospital again would, or, a, or a doctor's office would be like making an alcoholic a bartender. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And th- that didn't work for me at all. It didn't make any sense that they would let her back to work or that she would even want to go back to that temptation constantly. Um, but, you know, maybe that was just me. I found that to be a huge, like, plot hole, essentially, in the movie. Mm-hmm. For, but, you know, maybe it bothers maybe it bothers you less than I doubt. It, it wasn't, I, I, it's not that it didn't bother me. It's just there are so many more ridiculous things that I think That's it just true. got overshadowed. That's true. In the movie. Um, you know, for example, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but it kind of ties into that, where Katie drugs her, right? Yeah. This, this, this woman, Angela's a doctor. She's been a doctor for a long time. I think they say, I think it was like 20 years or something like that. She's, she's a, she knows what she's doing. And here she is clearly not feeling right. She doesn't know she's been drugged, but she has been a drug addict. But then she's going to continue driving around everywhere. She, she, first, when she gets in the car, she already isn't feeling great. And she, conti- she decides to drive. Then she literally passes out while driving, is lucky to not kill anybody or get pulled over or anything, and then drives home. And she clearly yeah. isn't over it yet. Like that to me is like insane, poor judgment. I did have a note about that. How did, or did she pull over when drugged? Because it never no. shows her pulling over. It looks like she just passes out in the middle of the street, yeah. but mm-hmm. she had the car turned off because it shows her turning the car back on when she comes to, and she had her seatbelt off. Yeah. So, I mean, so it's implied just that mistake. she passed out in the middle of the street, but then it yeah. looks like she's parked because there's not a bunch of cars honking at her back like that. She's backing up or anything like that. You don't see any cars trying to pass around her. No, or she's anything. asleep for hours. Yeah, exactly. So hours. yeah, the car got pulled over at some point, but mm-hmm. they don't really like it, it's a, it was a really weird thing to overlook. Yeah. It was just show, good. show her pulling over because she's feeling bad, you know, and that she thinks she's going to pass out. Mm-hmm. She's a doctor, but yeah, they didn't feel like showing that for some reason. Nope. Not even at all. Okay, so next or first, first into uh, Nick Cage's character is a huge piece of shit. Is a scene that happens next where they're talking about, um, you know, how they want to have another baby, and they're laying in bed, and uh, she's talking about how she's had all this trouble and and everything else, and she mentions that she's had five miscarriages. Mm-hmm. And Nick Cage immediately says, don't worry, baby, we can keep trying. We can keep trying. Now, this is going to get serious again. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever known, which a lot of people do know or have experienced a miscarriage, know somebody that has experienced miscarriage. I really doubt there's any woman in the world that has gone through one or more that would be like, yeah, sure. Let's keep trying. Very, Mm -hmm. very rarely, like five times. That's an insane amount to me. And then the fact that he's like, let's keep trying. We can keep trying. He's pressuring her in a really Mm -hmm. shitty way, even though she's making it clear she doesn't want to. It's a it's a bad line. It's a really bad line. And I don't know whether that's poor writing or if that was intentional, because the line ends with we're not out of options. Now, we're not out of options by itself is not a bad line because there is adoption. Right. There's the plan that they end up going through with. Right. So they're not out of options. However, the first part of that line, though, we can keep trying is really messed up. And so I don't know if that was just poor writing or if that was meant to show the character. Right. I, th- I don't know either, but right? it's, it's like it's not a greatly written film here. No, but I mean, <laughs> if I'm trying to convince you that his character is an asshole, then I think that's a really good starting point. It is. Yeah, that was <laughs> that stood out as probably one of the worst lines in the whole movie to me. I mean, it was just in really poor taste. And, you know, if any woman watching this movie would probably cringe or worse hearing that, I mean, that's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't disagree. Yeah. My next note, we've already kind of covered. Uh, I think they officially say that they're best friends after three days of knowing each other. (laughs) Cause I put best friends after three days, question mark. Cause I'm pretty sure one of the characters says this is my best friend or something like that um and then yeah that goes back to time being weird yes there's a lot of time skips where apparently nothing happened which is weird because sometimes the time skips are for months at a time Mm -hmm. uh between these characters that end up being very on edge with each other throughout this movie um 
yeah, so that was, that is a huge problem for me too. And I know we've talked about that on our other podcast that uh, movies that handle time weirdly. Uh, I think we even talked about that on the uh, It Can Happen to You podcast mm-hmm. is yeah. that time was very weird in that movie too. And there was no explanation as to how much time has passed, you know, nothing like that. This movie, they at least kind of show it through the pregnancy of the woman. Once you get to that point, but Once that's like that halfway point, that's like through halfway. the movie. Yeah, exactly. You know, and even then they'll skip months at a time. Yeah, they'll have like a huge blowout between the characters, and then there'll be like three months later, mm-hmm. and you're just expected to believe that nothing else has happened of interest during that time. Which, yeah. Um. Yeah. My next note was that who is the random guy at holiday dinners, which we covered. <laughs> we talked about that. Yeah. Uh. My that's next Barry, note is, man. That's Barry. Why is no one at Murder Beach? Yeah. So that bothered me a lot. So Linda is training for, I believe it's a triathlon and she's running up the beach. And I guess, you know, cause next she's going to do the water portion of the triathlon and Katie is supposed to meet her for breakfast. And this is when Katie finds out that she's supposed to, that Linda was picked to be the surrogate. Right. For and, the, for the rich yeah, doctors. And the whole thing, the timing of it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I'm not a triathlon person. Maybe I don't understand how long it takes to, to, to do one and swim all of that distance. But Katie's just supposed to like sit there on the beach and then they're going to go have breakfast as soon as Linda's done with like swimming 10 miles or whatever it is. Uh, that in itself was weird. But then, yeah, so, so Linda comes back and Katie's been standing in the water for however long Linda's been gone in her underwear. She's not like in a swimsuit or anything. And right. nobody's noticing this there's woman, nobody there like freezing to death in the water here there's uh, no one there the nobody there. completely there's empty it's completely not that no empty. one is noticing it's just that there's literally nobody there right yeah for whatever reason for whatever reason and then katie knocks out linda with a uh a dumbbell and drowns her yeah um, i mean potentially not even just knocking her out potentially that could have been what really killed her and then the drowning was like finishing it off but yeah there was possibly some serious yeah. brain trauma in there yeah I, that whole thing just really that that felt a bit much for me at that particular point and i guess it's because we don't really know everything about katie yet and it builds up it just continues to get worse as the movie progresses yeah but that just felt so out of left field to me it just it really caught me off guard. I was not expecting that. Uh, I mean, I was pretty early on in that scene. I mean, it, it definitely was like a setup. They're giving, they were giving that character too much development. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's pretty easy to pick when a character is going to die when that character starts to get a lot of character development in a specific scene. Like they're <laughs> either going to die in that scene or the next scene in a movie like this. I guess I wasn't expecting, I guess I wasn't really expecting her to kill anybody. Because the movie didn't seem to be pitched that way, well, you know. Because okay, like we, so, I, we, I guess we kind of skipped like Katie's origin story. Yeah, here. the very beginning of the story, they show Katie uh, holding a baby and running out of house, and it, it's made to look like she's escaping a bad marriage or something like that, an abusive right. marriage. It shows this guy randomly come into a, to this house and start choking her and telling her not to leave or something along those lines, and then she stabs him in the gut and kills him mm-hmm. um and it's made to impl- or it's made to look like she's in fact running away from an abusive marriage when in fact she murdered him to steal the baby and she had just gotten done murdering his wife or girlfriend or whatever the situation may have been up in the bathtub right before that to right. steal this baby and so i mean i kind of had some suspicions even in the very beginning that that like i was going to put that in my notes if it wasn't explained by the end of the movie that it was weird that we were just expected to believe that this woman uh, did nothing wrong and was trying to escape this guy when there was no context given on either side. Um, but obviously they did that on purpose, you know, because later it's revealed that she killed the mom upstairs and then the dad and was stealing their baby who was actually her baby. But yeah, kind of convoluted. We'll get to that part. But yes. So, so that's when it's first, like revealed fully to the audience that mm, this woman's a little more, I mean, it's kind of implied that she has some crazy shit going on. Like she's, a, she like puts these contact lenses in, which is supposed to be a big moment. And like, yeah, but that's supposed to be because she's on the run is the idea, right? That she, you know, some, some women's help group has put her and her kid kind of 
in a, you know, not a witness protection program, but just like helping them hide and get away from, you know, the abuser is basically what they're doing. So I, that was, that didn't really set off any alarms for me. Um, I guess I was just, you know, giving her the benefit of the doubt based on the pitch of the movie. I didn't really look any more into it. Yeah. No, I, I mean, maybe I'm an asshole for looking more into it, but yeah, I did. I didn't really buy in right away. Hmm. Um, and that suspicion obviously was revealed to be truth later. Um, my next note after murder beach, uh, was the doctor at this point, actually I have, I, I didn't write this in my notes, but I do want to talk about something. Um, this director, really has a focus on women's bodies yes big time he makes it very clear that he wants very specific parts of women's anatomy out and about center frame a mm-hmm. lot of the time mm-hmm. uh i mean one of the first early scenes we get with katie at the house is uh as a topless scene where she's in the pool i've been waiting for a time to bring that up that was the most unnecessary scene. gratuitous yeah like it, I, I, it's, I, had, I think it's made to imply that Nick Cage is like thinking about cheating or something because they kind of bring that up a few times. Well, it's supposed to set up when Angela catches Katie with another person having right. sex in the guest house. We're supposed to be with Angela. I'm like, oh, no, it's Brian. Right. But the way it's handled. So Nikki comes out of the guest house, which is right next to the pool. She takes off like a oversized shirt that she has from somewhere, yeah. uh, even though she's not with a guy that would own that shirt, but whatever. Um, and she's topless yeah. and she starts swimming in this pool and in uh, essentially a stranger's home. She's just moved in at this point. She yeah. has just moved into the house. She barely knows these people. She's swimming topless in their pool. Oh, out in the open, they have a kid, you yeah. know, the, the, the property doesn't appear to be fenced off in any kind of way. She has a kid too. Oh, well, yeah, she has a kid too. And she's just swimming there topless and Nick, like kind of looks at her sort of but i couldn't tell if that was like an uncomfortable like what the hell's going on i mean or... if it was uncomfortable i think he would have left i mean he was there for a little while he was there long enough for me to question it but not there too long for it to be obvious well it doesn't show him walking away so you don't really know oh, i thought it did okay i don't think it does. i thought he walked back in the house maybe he did i don't know i didn't honestly this movie but is a bad memory for me at this point it was a really completely unnecessary and odd scene right and then you get you know with the bodybuilder woman murder thing mm-hmm. there's a lot of gratuitous like breast shots not necessarily topless but like really focused on her mm-hmm. back or her, her butt and like her breasts yeah. and uh you know not everybody is going to a movie to see that kind of thing and this director seems like he may have been had an ulterior motive with some of this yeah to just see some tna well, the you weirdest know. thing about it is if, if you wanted to have Nikki Whelan topless or naked, then why didn't you do it in the sex scene? Right. There's a scene you have specifically <laughs> in that movie. Right. Like, I'm not saying that that would have been a good idea or not. I'm just saying if you're going to do it, if it has to be in your movie, isn't that where it goes? You would think. But then she wouldn't have been wet, which is another thing that he seems to enjoy. There you I go. mean, he, uh, it's because he, then there's another topless scene with the woman that uh katie murders in a bathtub yep. who's also wet i'll mm-hmm. add um that has her breasts on display because she's taking a bath um so yeah that was kind of distracting in this movie the, the director seemed very focused on that and maybe he was relying on that to sell his movie a little bit more than the actual like quality of the film yeah i'm sure that there's definitely people who see something as rated r for nudity and they're like all right i might as well check it out I'm yeah. sure that those people are out there. And this one, I guess, does that for you because you could absolutely have shot the bathtub murder scene in a different way or made it a different kind of murder. Pretty easy. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. But like if you if you wanted it to be the drowning in the tub, because like the idea, right, is that she does it in such a way where it kind of looks like an accident then I can see the tub murder being a smart narrative point. But you didn't have to shoot it like that. Right. That's the key. A lot of a lot of shows and movies do tub murders that are not like that right and and i I honestly think that the nudity in this movie is really what pushed it to be an r-rated movie i think without the extra nudity that it would have been probably a pg-13 movie because the violence was not crazy you know the language wasn't crazy i mean yes there was some bad language but uh, i feel like 
it could have easily been a PG-13 movie. And they probably would have done better. It probably would have done better at the box office if uh, if it had been. Yeah, that's that's definitely a possibility. Uh, I'm just trying to think because like some of the, the subject director matter, would have gotten to do that. <laughs> well, right. Yeah. Some of the subject matter is just kind of heavy and some of the violence that does take place contextually might have pushed it. There's a lot of PG-13 movies but, that are pretty dark, yeah. but uh, you know, that's yeah. neither here nor there. Uh, my next note is after uh, Katie has the surrogate or gets, you know, pregnant with the surrogate baby or however that's, I don't even know how phrasing works with that kind of thing. Um, but the doctor is doing an exam on her mm-hmm. and he's down in there mm-hmm. in the trenches, so to speak. And he says, looking good at least three times. Mm-hmm. If I was a, to go to the doctor and he was inspecting my genitalia and he said, looking good three times, I would be really worried about p- that. I picked the right doctor for this. <laughs> I mean, that's fair. That that's certainly fair. That whole bit was pretty crazy. Um, Cause it also ties into like what, it ties into the genesis of the whole story that she went through some kind of procedure where she was donating eggs and something went wrong in that procedure where she got an infection or something. And those were the last three eggs she could donate. Now, look, I, I, I don't have any idea what goes into those types of procedures. So I don't really know how realistic that scenario is, but I don't feel like the movie did a good enough job of selling me on the realistic aspects of that happening. It felt kind of crazy and like maybe that's where her money came from then actually maybe that makes sense maybe she sued malpractice and that's why she has money could be i mean maybe that 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 would help make more sense of it right because like how could they do that to her have that be a realistic scenario they do that to her and then she ends up pour out in a motel like that just seems insane to me and you know there's horrible people in the world so i guess it's certainly possible but you know, I don't know. Maybe too, she was only staying in the motel to make uh, the rich couple feel sorry for her so that they would offer to give her the guest house. Right. Like that's the like how she's clearly a con artist to some degree. Right. She's not like a swindler per se, but she's manipulative. Yeah. Right. She lies about who she is and her identity and the whole nine. So it's just another lie. Yeah. Um, my next note says <laughs> dressed exactly alike and dash totally different so at one point angela gina gershon's character walks in to katie uh into wherever they were hanging katie and the girls were hanging out the daughters at the um, playground yeah something like that and they had done the girl's hair the same mm-hmm. and she goes out and says oh look at you girls you're dressed exactly alike but the girls are dressed completely different <laughs> the only thing that was the same was their hair Mm -hmm. anyway that's not really that important of a point it just bothered me um my next note says nick cage piece of shit in this movie yes we covered that um random drone shots did they bother you too they were super noticeable this movie clearly like they wanted they wanted establishing shots of the city but they clearly didn't have the budget for it right and, and so, I think like one of the very first shots in the movie is a drone shot. And I was like, and I was yeah. like, okay, maybe that's the only one and we'll be fine. But then it's throughout this whole movie. No, they keep using them as establishing shots and they didn't want to use like, they didn't want to pay for stock establishing shots. And yeah. so they shot them with somebody's drone. And it was, it really was noticeable. Yes. It was. But like, so is like the house though. So like, I guess as the movie went on, the house got better, but early on, it in was the so film, empty. It was, it looked like nobody lived there. Yeah. It we looked like it had too. been staged to sell. Yeah, exactly. And it probably was. They probably rented it for like, you know, a few months for shooting or however long. And they were like, well, we don't really need to furnish this. But like by the end of the movie, it looked like they lived there again. So it was really inconsistent. I would love to have known the order in which things were shot. Right. You know, it was very weird. Yeah. And especially was... considering this woman, Gia Gershon's character, has has been living there because she hasn't been working. Mm -hmm. Would she be okay as a rich person living in this completely empty house? Obviously not, but yeah, that didn't stop it. So when we talk about Nick, Nick Cage's character, Brian being an asshole, one, one, like one of the really big ones for me where I was finally like, Holy shit was the name naming the kid because so, you know, Katie's carrying Angela and Brian's kid or whatever. And they, they reveal this, 
mural type thing and it says Ga- Gabriel and Angela has no idea where the name came from and Brian's like we talked about it like you had like half a dozen names you were discussing and he just decided on one without telling her right another exhibit into Nick Cage's character as an asshole and I was like Jesus is like and I guess I took it as like is he that fucking dense and disconnected he's being manipul- I, I took that as he's being manipulated by Katie yeah I mean, that's, that's fair. I'm sure that's doesn't make it less of an asshole though. But like, it was just so mind boggling. They already have a kid. This isn't like new territory. Right. Right. And he didn't think to like confirm the name with his wife. Yeah, it was definitely not ideal. I mean, a lot of this movie is, is this movie basically takes a lot of sitcom tropes and then does them in a serious way. The biggest one being just not talking to people. Right. If people just had discussions, then everything would have been solved. Exactly. Except it's just not funny here. Right. You know, and that I never really like that trope. Just talk to people. This is your wife, man. She lives here. You see her all the time. You sleep in the same room together. Like, just talk to her. Yeah. So at some point, Gina Gershon's character breaks into the breaks into her own guest house (laughs) where Katie's staying. (laughs) <laughs> and reads a bunch of shit in a book and somehow puts it together that potentially there's something going on here with Katie and the fact that she could be related to uh, where they got the egg from for their first child. So at this point, when she starts to go to break into the guest house, at this point, this is where the movie for me went from what the hell is going on to, okay, now I'm just going to sigh at every decision the Angela character makes yeah. because it was just such an eye roll response for me that she was going to go and break into this. Cause I knew it wasn't going to go well. I knew you're going to move something or not put something back where it's supposed to be. And Katie's going to somehow notice that something's yeah, except, out of place. Come on. That did happen. But like it was, the book was turned like a quarter inch counterclockwise. And all of a sudden this character is apparently uh, uh, the person that can just pick up any minute detail they weren't in the right order either, but either way, like I, I wouldn't remember if my books were out of order. I'm not saying that I would either. Right. But I knew the moment she was going in there, I was like, okay, so Katie's going to find out that something's out of place. Yeah. The movie got really predictable. You know, it, it was predictable. A lot of it before this, but this is when it started to get very predictable. Mm-hmm. My next note says random employee giving suicide info. So if you remember, uh, Angela calls. The oh, donation or the, the like egg place and is asking about who the donor was and blah, blah, blah. And they won't give her that info. But when she asks about the person that like ran this company, this person's like, Oh, she killed herself. And like giving all this information out. <laughs> I, it, I'm, this was another sigh moment where it's, every character's decision in this movie is ridiculous. It's not just Angela. That phone call was insane to me. Um, like, I get that the movie wants to imply that Katie killed Monica Wheeler. I get that. And it's in, it's in context with the character by the end of the film. So I have no problem believing that the Katie character killed her. I have no problem believing that, but that conversation was nuts. Yeah. Nobody would give out that kind of information. Even if you were okay with saying the official cause of death, that's still, that's where the conversation ends. Even if you get that far, you're not going to then contradict. You don't even know who you're talking to. Yeah. It could have been Tell a newspaper it's... trying to like come up with like a hit piece or something. Yeah, and no she was idea. giving like this conspiracy theory that there was ruled a suicide, but that this lady was so happy and loved life and would never kill herself. Like, okay. And by the way, this also introduces a very common villain trope where if villains were ju- like, these villains are all brilliant, except like also kind of dumb at the same time. So Katie is an artist. And rather than come up with a new idea, for each mural, she just repaints the same one over and over, over, and over. again, <laughs> tying her to each situation one at a time. <laughs> like, yeah, come on. You're so telling me she she's smart enough to manipulate and get past all of these people and get all of her kids, all of her eggs back. She's she's that smart. She's that deceptive, but she can't just paint a different picture. Yeah. My next note says. This is well, this is going to be exhibit C and this is just the ones we're talking about. There's more <laughs> examples in the movie, but I just I picked out the big ones. Nick Cage let a pregnant mom go talk to a mentally unstable woman alone while he drank. Yep. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So when 
when this whole thing there's like a party and there's a big blow up at this party between the the uh, Angela who just got drugged and uh Katie who's throwing a surprise baby shower for her and uh, they have a blow up fight and uh everybody leaves at Nick Cage's direction and they the women start yelling at each other one of them walks off and then the other one, I think Angela gets into like an argument with Nick Cage and they, and he starts pouring himself a drink. She goes off and says, I'm going to go talk to her. Maybe it was the other way around. It either the other way, way around. It's fine. Either way, uh, Nick Cage just starts drinking like a scotch yeah. and lets these two women that hate each other go into the kitchen and have a conversation. Big surprise. One of them stabs the other one. Okay. So, so let's, let's not go too fast. So, Nick Cage here, like this is this is what helped uh, kind of solidify the idea. Like he's just a total absentee human being here. He just doesn't give a shit what's going on. She ruined his day. He's gonna go drink in the other room. What whatever the fuck happens, and that was just like all right, whatever. And then yeah, they, they cut to the kitchen. Angela's in there. Katie comes in, and Angela's response is to pull a steak knife on the woman carrying her unborn child. Yeah. Or a unborn child. Doesn't even really matter at this point. You're pulling a steak knife on a pregnant woman. Yeah. And like, don't get me wrong. Katie's a bad person. She did drug Angela. We have there's no qualms there. Okay. But like you pull the steak knife on a clearly like third trimester pregnant woman. But Katie's not to be outdone. She's gonna stab herself <laughs> with that knife. Right. And then like pull a fight club and just beat the shit out of herself. Now, that was completely unbelievable to me. After everything else going on in this movie, that was one of the most unbelievable parts because the whole premise is Katie is so hell-bent on getting her babies back, on protecting her babies, on giving them the life they deserve, and tr- and sh- you know, get, teaching these other women a lesson for not you know, sacrificing for their children. But she's willing to risk literally stabbing her unborn kid yeah that's what i my next note was how did the knife miss the baby because i mean she's not a doctor that uh angela is a doctor right but katie is Katie is not a doctor she i don't feel like in the heat of the moment would have the forethought to like be like oh well if if it's just over here then it's gonna miss the baby she's also she's not an assassin right Right. she's murdered some people but she's not a trained assassin no she doesn't have any fighting the risk would be through the roof i just i don't believe that she would have risked the baby in that scenario like that i just don't i i that completely disconnected yeah yeah my next note is predictable with an exclamation point because it's very predictable I guess to me, it just seemed so outlandish that I didn't even consider it. I, I mean, as soon as the knife came out, I knew exactly what was going to happen. I don't know how this stuff didn't like you didn't see well, it. You're I, smarter than I am. Because I thought I feel it was, like you should have seen it a mile away. I guess I thought it was going to go a different direction. I really I thought Angela was going to get locked up. I really thought that we were going to end the opposite way. I thought wow. Katie was I, thought, I thought Katie was going to get away with it. The way the movie was going, I thought we were going to get like the not happy ending. No, that would have been too creative for this movie. I guess I gave it, I guess I gave it too much credit, but that's where I thought they were going. I thought that they were really going to do the non-happy ending. Yeah. Well then, okay. So at this <laughs> point it's revealed that well, they go to the hospital and somewhere in here, Angela had given Barry it to, it turns out is like a forensic scientist of some kind. Uh, the, some, a drink glass DNA yeah. that had DNA on him. And he wanted, they wanted him to test the DNA for the kid and, and the, uh, and Katie to find out if they were related, which is what she suspected a lot of this time. And so while uh, Angela's, you know, whoever's dead, they, they make it seem like she's dead. Uh, well, see, and that exchange makes no sense. Yeah. Right. So the doctor comes out to just Nick Cage's character, Brian and another doctor, and says, I'm sorry, Brian. Yes. With no context given. No context given. We cut away. Yes. And and uh, Barry, right before this, has just given Nick Cage the results of this DNA test. So then it's revealed that they swindled Katie to get her baby. They reported her to the police. There's this big reveal that this is, you know, which 
is it really a big reveal though? Because first of all, it's super predictable, at least to me. And then uh, when did they have time to set this whole thing up? It is supposed to be like a big reveal, but it's not like they've been setting this up the whole movie. It literally is like a minute and a half of screen time. So to me, it sounded it, the only way that it works is if they kind of did some illegal stuff because so my, my wife had a C-section for our kid. They don't put you under for that. They don't do that. She's awake. The, the, the mother is awake the whole time. Right. So they would have had to drug her during that procedure, which would have so, had its own risk inherent to, you know, so they, giving they, birth. they give Katie anesthesia. Now, maybe there was something medically wrong that I, I either missed or they didn't say that required that. I'm not a doctor. Well, the in stab a, wound, maybe. Maybe the stab wound had something to do with it. Certainly possible. But they kept her under for an extended period of time. Yes. And that's implied by the way she wakes up. So they kept her under longer than the procedure would have required, which I can't imagine is legal. So they, they, they keep this woman under without getting the cops involved yet. Which so this is a citizen's arrest, I guess, where they're going to keep this woman unconscious. Where they're just basically abusing their power as doctors to get right. other doctors to do favors for them. Which is just like all kinds of illegal. I'm not saying that it's never happened. Gro- it gross malpractice. Happen. But yeah, but very illegal. Yeah. And and then like they they do the big like sh- she makes out. With Brian, which was just kind of crazy in of itself, but at this point, I guess I'm just along for yeah, the ride. Yeah, then it's then it, at that point, it's implied that she was going to try and steal Brian. Yeah, which I mean, they hadn't really done much of that throughout the movie. I mean, they, they made there was never any interest shown from Brian towards her, or even vice versa. Well, I mean, she had her boobs out like topless, and and maybe but it was going to be implied there that she wanted Brian to see her. Maybe, but. She never says that. She doesn't that's know true. that he's watching. She doesn't like even give like a sideways glance or anything. So that's that's a huge that's like that in itself is an assumption. And then the rest of the time she's with this Linda girl. So she she basically tells us that she doesn't really go with men anymore because of what happened to her. And they have the exchange when Angela thinks that Linda's actually Brian, right? And you know, Katie's all like, no, 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 of course not. So yeah, they never build that up. Right. And now, 10 minutes, you know, after the mother dies that yeah, they're making out they're making out like it's just at that point i guess i was just i was just along for it at that point yeah i mean and so this is towards the end of my notes i don't i don't really have any notes beyond these you know i had when did they have time to set up this elaborate plan and then they just keep the killer's kid as notes so like not only did the cops come and set this up but then the cops were like sure you can just have this kid that is not how that would have gone in real life I, it, even if it's a surrogate situation, that kid would have been like a proper city or state property well, or something like that. So here's where that gets complicated. So, you know, Katie's the surrogate. No, when the agreement was made and everything like that, that was a donated egg. So from like, it gets, it can get really complicated from a contractual perspective. Right. And the movie brings that up that like, if Angela shows herself to be unstable or back on drugs and things like that, Katie can like, cancel the contract and keep the kid basically yeah maybe it works the other way around and since katie clearly you know broke the law here in certain ways and she went to prison but like they get the other kid too which is even like like that's even yeah so now they have now they have three kids they go from one to three how do they get katie's kid that's the one that really makes zero sense to me Uh, because at least at least the the newborn kid is that's probably what Ryan's I meant kid. by they just keep killer's kid. I'm assuming. Oh, okay. That's what I I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. No, it's okay. The, the baby is at least Brian's kid, genetically speaking, and yeah. contractually is probably still Angela's. That is more of a gray area since we never see a trial or anything like that. Um, but Katie's kid is not either of Brian or Angela's in any respect. Right. She just happens to be a, a half sibling to these other two kids. Right. Or I guess, yeah. Well, I guess a full sibling to the, to Angela and Brian's other kid, either way. Right. They're just related to each other. So I guess maybe they adopt her and they just cut out that. I don't know, man, that made very little sense. Yeah. The whole thing was very weird, but like the, the scene where they go to like the baby nursery and stuff and Nick has his big moment right? The reason he was probably signed on for this movie is this big moment. And it just, 
that was just such like a cruel leap from the rest of the movie, from his perspective and everything like that, that it just was like, I don't know, it was horrible. The whole thing was just horrible. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think that uh, that this, I think, is our longest episode so far, which shows how much we did not like this movie. Uh, And, you know, we aren't necessarily going to nitpick everything about every movie, um, but this one was just really bad. And maybe we'll run into more of those. I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, there was a lot to talk about in this. Uh, You know, it was it was not good. I don't ever see myself watching it again. Um, And I don't see myself recommending anybody watch it, no matter how much I hate them. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I second all of that. It was bad. I mean, I when the movie ended, I just sat there in silence for a while. Like, I just didn't even know how to react to that. Because in the end, they're, they're all on the bed together, and they're happy, and Katie's locked away in an institution somewhere, and it's just like, what the fuck was that? Yeah. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was bad. Fun fact. Lindsay Lohan was originally supposed to star and produce uh, this film. And I assume as the Katie character, um, which would have been interesting to say the least. Yeah. But otherwise, I mean, so, okay. So Nick Cage and Nikki Whelan, who plays Katie, this is actually one of three movies they're together in. Right. And uh, Gina Gershon, Gershon was in uh, face off yep. with him also. So maybe Nick was just like, well, I get to do a movie with a couple of friends. <laughs> So. maybe maybe <laughs> there's worse ways to make a couple million bucks right true you know that that must have been it from what i can understand so how how are we going to rate this thing okay so we've got our cage meter it's broken into four quadrants each movie is rated on a 20 point scale in overall quality with 20 being the greatest movie of all time and i guess zero being the worst and Cageness, caginess, caginess, how crazy cage is, with 20 being the most outlandishly caginess we can imagine, zero being just complete lack of cageness. Okay. Yeah. Um, we are going to post the cage meter out on social media. We th- we hadn't done that as I'm recording this because I want to get a couple of dots on there before we released it, but it should be out by now because of episode three, I'm releasing it with episode three. So and I'm pretty sure that this one will have its own quadrant to itself. I think so. At least beginning, you know, for, for now. Yeah, I definitely think so. So with that in mind, Ryan, what do you think the quality of this movie is from zero to 20? Uh, I mean, I've seen worse movies. Sure. Sure. I don't want to put this at the lowest possible rating because I feel like we have a hundred and some more movies to go mm-hmm. and there's probably going to be worse. Uh, I'm going to say it's probably a three or a four somewhere in there. Okay. Well, which, which would you like a three or a four? Well, where are you going? And we'll see what, see if you were close to either of those. I was actually going to go a little bit higher wow. okay. and I was going to give it a six. Okay. So we'll just go on a five. Okay. Well, the average is a five then. There you go. Now, caginess. We usually take turns here. So I'll go first with caginess. There's that last scene in the nursery where maybe he gets a little cagey, you know, with the get a good look, Katie kind of thing. But that's one scene in the whole movie. The rest of the time, he's just kind of a aloof jerk. And so I'm going to put this at like a seven. That seems a little high to me. Yeah. You think that's high? He's not really cagey at all until that last scene. And even that last scene is not that cagey. I mean, if you're just ranking that scene by itself, maybe it would be like a seven. I guess because that's talking about the whole movie. Yeah. It's less than that for me. I would put it at like a four or a five somewhere again, somewhere in there. Okay. Well, if I'm putting it at a seven and you're putting it at a five, then we're at a six. Sure. So it still five. seems a little high to me, but Hey, it's our, that's the way this scoring works. Well, five, six. I mean, that's still pretty low. That puts it in the low quality, low cageness in the kind of the, the top, the top left, the top right corner of that quadrant. But, Which we'll share this on social media yeah, at some point. So you can take a look there. So there you go. That's that. Now the last piece 
that we have to do here is we have to figure out what movie is going to replace Inconceivable on our Wheelo cage. So after this, we'll spin our Wheelo cage to decide what movie we're going to review next. But we have to replace Inconceivable on our wheel, which holds 18 cage movies. So here we go. We're going to pick our next film to go on the wheel. O cage is, Oh, leaving Las Vegas. There we go. Now we're talking. There we go. So leaving Las Vegas will join 17 other cage films to find out what all those are. Check out the wheel. O cage spin coming up at coming of There you can find all of our links to subscribe to the show on your platform of choice and following us on Twitter is something you could definitely do or Facebook and all that good stuff. Come talk to us, share your, your caginess with us. Ryan, anything else this week? I'm good. You're good. I think I talked plenty. Good. You're good. I'm good. This movie's done. Let's move on to the Please, next one. For the love of God. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Bye-bye.